Hello, the topic for today is integration, namely a definite integral. Now, in calculus, we learned the trick for that. We find antiderivative, and then we substitute upper limit, lower limit, subtract, we are done. In applications, this is not always so easy. In particular, because the function f itself need not be given as a formula, but rather as a collection of, let's say, measurements. But even if it's a formula, still the situation can get really complicated. Here is an example, and it's a famous one. Let's say that you want a definite integral from the function e to negative x squared. This is actually a very important integral, and statistics relies on it heavily. However, the function e to negative x squared as a continuous function has antiderivative. It's a nice function, but it cannot be written as an algebraic formula or closed algebraic formula, to be precise. And if you don't have it as an algebraic formula, then you cannot substitute in limits and do the usual trick. So for this type of integral, the calculus approach does not help, but we need to know the value. So there is a big demand for numerical methods that would help us evaluate or approximate definite integrals. This is actually one of the oldest questions in numerical analysis, and it used to be called numerical quadrature, or just quadrature. How do we do it? Well, actually, we take inspiration from the definition. Let's have a look at it. Here we have an interval a, b. There is a function floating over it somehow. And we are interested in the area under the graph. And definition says that we should look at partitions. Partitions, it means that we split the interval a, b into segments. And over each segment, we are supposed to erect a rectangle of a suitable height. And then these areas are put together. There is some limiting process or supremum infimum process, and it works out. It's a good idea, but it's not practical. Because there are too many possibilities. So if you want to do something applicable, we have to restrict our attention to nice partitions. Namely, we are going to focus on partitions, which are so-called equidistant which means that the segments are all of the same length. And if you want to take an interval and divide it into segments of the same length, you need to know how many of them there are, and that's it. That's all the information that you need to start with. So lowercase n, that's the traditional name for the partition size. And when you split interval a, b into n equal segments, then the length of one segment is easily calculated. It's just the length of the interval divided by the number of segments. And that's a very important formula. I'm emphasizing it in this way because I will be returning to it repeatedly. OK, we have our step size. And when we have the step size, we easily determine the points of the partition. We can even write it down as a formula. How many of them are there? That's a good question. If there are n segments, then you have left end point for each of them. And then there is an extra point which ends the last segment. So there will be n plus 1 points, and it makes sense to call the first one x0. So that will be the a, or x0. And then there is x1, x2, and so on. And you can see the partition size h over here. And the last point happens to be xn, so everything fits very nicely. And for each of these points in the partition, you get function value. And that's the data that we want to work with. And again, this is really tied to the real-life applications, because typically, when you have some function, you know its values at regular intervals. That's a natural way of arranging it. For instance, uh, let's say you are interested in temperature, so you set up some measuring device and records the temperature, let's say, once an hour. So you get nice, regularly spaced values of your function. Uh, this is called sampling, when you have a function known just by values. So we have a sample of our function, and a good question is, how do we use it to actually approximate, and now we are talking not about limit, but about actual number. How do we approximate the integral? Let's call it capital I. Well, let's have a look at a better picture with just small partition numbers so that we can approximate or appreciate better what's happening. Here we go, our function f, and let's say that I use partition size 4. So here is four segments, easy to do, easy to arrange. 
And now, when it comes to numerical integration, the focus is on one panel, which means on one strip. Okay? So here is one strip. And I actually have just two pieces of information here. And my motivation is to find a rectangle which is a reasonably good approximation. Since I have just two candidates for the height, I will choose, let's say, the left one, because it's, well, I see it right here. So I use left rectangle, so to speak, that's how it's called. And that, I hope, is an approximation that is not totally worthless of the area under this part of my function. Okay? And of course, I'm going to do the same for all other panels. Each time I'm using the value on the left to find the approximation of the area under the graph. And when I put all these areas together, I will get an approximation of the area under the function f. So the formula goes like this. The integral i will be approximated by the area of the first rectangle. The base is h, and the height is f at a, but it's better to write f at x0. This is the area for the first rectangle. And then comes the area for the second rectangle, h times fx1, and so on. And the last one, let's imagine that the partition size is n now. So for the last rectangle, I'm taking base h and multiplying it by the value at the left point, which is the second last partition point, f, x, n, minus 1. And that's the approximating formula. There is a name for this idea. This is called the left rectangle method or left rectangle formula, or left rectangle rule, and so on. Uh, okay, let's try it out. So, I have an integral example. From 1 to 9, I'm trying to integrate logarithm x dx. Okay, uh, do I like this integral? Well, actually, it's not bad. Antiderivative to logarithm can be found in books, or you can determine it by integration by parts. But let's say that I don't just feel like integrating by parts at the moment, so I apply left rectangle method and see what we get. Partition size, let's say 4. We had a good experience with 4 over here, so why not? And then the step size will be the length of the in interval, which is 9 minus 1, which is actually 8. Divided into 4 pieces gives me 2. That was easy, wasn't it? Okay, now let's see. It's actually not a bad idea to draw a picture when the partition size is reasonably small. So here is my interval 1 to 9. I'm splitting it into four chunks. So now even common sense tells us that the partition, that the step size is 2, and the partition points are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Okay, let's see. The integral will be approximated by, and I'm going to substitute. And actually, it's a common practice to factor out the step size, so that you don't have to keep repeating it all over. So I am factoring out the step size, too. And for the first rectangle, it's base times the height at 1, which is logarithm at 1. I'm just substituting. For the second rectangle, it's base 2 times the height at 3 and 5, and 7, and I shouldn't overcook it, 7, that's the last one, okay? For the last rectangle, value on the left, that's it. And yeah, that's it actually. I just approximated the value of this definite integral using the left rectangle method. Very easy, if you encounter it at the exam, you will rejoice most likely, and you can leave it like that. Actually, I appreciate it if you leave it like that, because I look at it and I see what you did. So you don't really have to worry about telling me that logarithm at 1 is 0 or putting it together using some identities, whatever. Yeah, I leave it like that. I like it. Natural question. Why left rectangles? Why not right rectangles? Well, why not? Okay, let's have a look at it. Here is my interval AB. Here is my function F. Here is my partition size 4, my strips, which I now call panels, to sound scientific. In the first panel, 
I will use the value on the right, and I am getting a rectangle like that, and the area of this rectangle is the base times the value on the right, which is x1. So this is the area of the first rectangle, plus the area of the second rectangle. Here I'm taking the height on the right, and the area is h times f at x2. And I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going, and the last rectangle, let me get to it, the last rectangle has base h, and height is at uh, f at b, which is f at xn. Here we go. So that will be the right rectangles. And you can attach the name method, rule, formula, whatever. Okay, before we move on, let's have a look at this picture. What I'm actually doing, I can be thinking of it as approximating area by another area, but I can also see it this way. I took the function f and I replaced it with a step function. Here is a step function, and here is a step function. Step function means a function which is composed of segments which are constant functions. That's also a useful point of view. Okay, so here is a slide which confirms that the left rectangle rule uses the formula that we can see on the right. We factored out the step size h and we got this. And there is also a summation form for those who like summations, which is nice, compact form, uh, nothing wrong about it. And it's called RL, R for rectangles, L for left, no problem there. By the way, this notation is not totally universal, but many people use it. And if I scroll, I get a formula for the right rectangle for rule, which uh, again agrees with what we did over here. Essentially, those rules are more or less identical when you think about it. Especially if you imagine that the partition size is large, then majority of the terms is actually shared, starting with x1 and ending with x and minus 1. This middle segment is common to both formulas. They just differ which part they ignore. The left rectangles, they ignore the right endpoint, and the right rectangles, they ignore the left endpoint. So when you think about it, when there is like a hundred of these terms, if you ignore this or that, it doesn't make much difference. So expectation, intuitive expectation is that these two methods should be essentially identical in, uh, let's say, practical work, in practical behavior. Let me actually finish the example. So if I want to use the right rectangles, I should skip the first value and just use the second, and so on, and I keep going, and I stop when I get to the last value. Okay, so that would be the right rectangles. And now here is place for another example. I don't want to use the logarithm. Actually, I don't mind it. Uh, it it's a nice function, it looks like that, when you start at 1 and go to 9. Nothing wrong about it. But instead, I'm going to look at the integral from 0 to pi over 2 sine of x, the x. Now you may say, okay, why the difference? I mean, sine of x between 0 and pi over 2, it also looks like this. So the picture should be essentially identical to an informed reader. Well, here is the fundamental difference. I know here that the answer is 1. Here the answer I know, but it's not so nice. So if I use this as an example in Maple, and we get some answer, for instance, a number like that, I will see immediately whether it's good or not. I can check on the error easily. So here I'm integrating sine between 0 and pi over 2. The method is right rectangles, and number of steps is 4, just like we have here in this picture, in this example. Bang. So the formula tells us, or the pro uh, procedure tells us, that we are using step size 0 point, essentially 0.4. This is a very useful information. We will get to it. And the outcome is 1.18. Now we know that the correct answer is 1, so it's not all that great. But, well, okay, that's life. And since we are wondering how good it is, let me do a little trick. I will ask for output to be the graph. And Maple thinks that it's calculating this. We can see those four rectangles. And we know that the areas of these rectangles are attempting to estimate the area under the graph, and we can see that there is quite a big difference. So those little triangles here, they are not really triangles, but they sort of look like triangles. 
these little pieces here, this is actually the errors, and we will get to it soon. And when I use partition size 4, those errors, those extra parts are really, really huge. So I cannot really expect good approximation. Let's try left rectangles. And I think that we will see what we expect to see. We see four rectangles, although the leftmost one has a height of zeros. But it's still a rectangle, okay? No re zero rectangle is still a rectangle. And again, we see those empty triangles. These are the errors. That's the area that we didn't account for. And if I ask for the value, I just erase this graph output, then the method of left rectangles thinks that the integral should be 0.79. So the error is roughly 0.21. That's a rather large error. Which brings us to the key question. We have two new methods, method of left right rectangles. And in numerical analysis, we always ask, what is the error of the method? Meaning the absolute error, usually, as the first step. So we want to know what's the difference between the actual value of the integral and the approximation that we offered instead. There are some interesting points. Well, intuitively, there is a parameter which describes the quality. We saw it with the derivative. We have it here with the integral. And intuitively, this parameter should be the step size h. Why do I think so? Well, let's have a look at this. Imagine that I tell you that I approximated some integral with partition size 2, so I used two segments. What does it mean about the quality? Well, let's see. Let's say that my integral looked like that. This is the area that I'm trying to approximate. And if I use partition size 2, then I'm making quite a big error. This is with the right rectangles. On the other hand, if the integrating range was like that, and I used partition size 2, then the error seems to be rather small. So the partition size by itself does not really tell us anything about quality. For quality, for appreciation of quality, you need to relate the partition size and the range of the integral. But that's exactly what this formula does. So the step size is exactly the right measure of quality just like it was with derivatives. Here the step size is huge and the approximation is quite bad. Here the step size is small and the approximation is much better. Okay. This is, by the way, one of the advantages of integration, numerical integration. You actually see the errors in the picture. Okay, what is the error here? This is the error. This is the error. This is the error. This is the error. These are so-called local errors, errors in one panel and we will soon confirm that when you sum them up, you get the total error. You can see it easily here. The total error is just the sum of these two guys. So the natural viewpoint is to use h, step size, as the parameter for the error. However, we cannot do it formally in theorems definitions. Why not? Because we cannot choose step size freely. Imagine that this integral is between 0 and 1. And you decide to use step size 0.4. You start at 0, you go to 0.4, the next step takes you to 0.8, and you are in trouble. Because the next step will take you to 1.2. 0.8, 1.2, these are not good, you need to get to 1. And that's why in Theory, we have to always start with the partition size, and for the partition size, then you develop or de derive the step size. So we can think of it this way. We would like to have step sizes as our point of view, but not all of them are allowed. Only some are permissible, depending on the length of the integrating range. And for those special step sizes, then we develop some formulas. Okay, what do we expect? Uh, there is something which is called qualitative analysis, when you are not asking about precise formulas, but just influences. So what influences do we see? If I develop some formula, what do I expect to see there? Well, okay, I see, always I see some constant. So let's put it there, easy. I definitely expect to see the step size featuring in some way. What way, I am not sure. But I do expect to see something here with step size. What else? Well, how do I recognize from the picture and from the overall setting whether the error is small or large? 
And now let's disregard the step size as a factor. So we have a fixed step size. How do I determine whether the error is small or large from the picture? Well, one influence is the length of the picture or length of the integration range. If it's longer, then there is a better chance of creating error. We make more of them. For instance, if you double the integration range and the function is, let's say, periodic, then you simply double the error. And if you triple the integrating range, you triple the error. So our expectation is that the error will be directly proportional to the length of the integration range. Definitely. This looks like quite a good guess, safe guess. So that's the number of the panels. That's handled with this B minus A. How about individual panel? Can we somehow recognize key factor whether this error will be small or large? I look at my picture and those errors do not look always the same. For instance, here. Here we can see large error. And here this one is much smaller, although this, OK. Picture is not quite correct, but these are supposed to be uh, strips of equal width. Well, when you look at this, there is a big difference between the slope or steepness of the function. Let's have a look at it here. We have two panels. On one, the function is steep. On another, it's not steep. It's rather flat, or perhaps this flat. What will be the error? Well, we are using rectangles. We are using horizontal segments to approximate our function. Here, the error is outrageous. Here, the error is uh, reasonable. So the important factor from the point of view of the shape of the function is the steepness or the speed of ri race or growth. So what I want to see here is something which talks about steepness, and steepness means derivative. So these are the key factors that I expect to see after I develop some formula for the error. Okay. Now, this error that I'm going to develop will be so-called global error. It will be the difference between the integral, i, and the formula which I obtain, for instance here, from the left rectangle method. And this is what I'm really interested in, global error, and I expect it to look like that. But to get there, we have to first focus on individual panels, because there are those other factors, the steepness, things like that. Width of the panel, definitely a factor. So we are going to focus on just one panel, and to make our life easier, we forget about partitions. We forget that there are 150 panels. Let's have a look at just one. It starts here, it has a width, and it ends here, therefore. Okay? There is some function, and we want to approximate this area with an area of just single rectangle. That's our aim now. What error do we make? And this will be a local error. That's our question. Well, the local error is the difference between the area in this one panel and the approximating expression, which could be, for instance, this one. But how do we subtract this number, which is just a product, from an integral? This is impossible to cancel or anything. So in order to work it out, we need to do a little trick. We need to look at this integral that we are trying to approximate and rewrite it in a different way, which is, uh, let's say, more user-friendly, which can be handled easier. And for that, we are going to use a little trick. I'm going to look at it and ask myself, OK, x is a dummy variable in the integral, c is fixed, what is moving is h, the width of the panel. So this is, in fact, a function of the width h, and as such, it has Taylor expansion. How does it look like? Well, I have to choose center. I'm interested in really narrow panels, so I'm imagining that h should be close to 0, so 0 will be the center f at 0 plus f prime at 0 h plus 1 half f double prime at 0 h square plus 1 over 3 factorial so that the reader can see the factorial. And that's enough. I could put three dots here, polynomial going to infinity, but I prefer to put capital O h4, which is the notation that we introduced before, and it's very useful. Okay. So that's the tail expansion applied to capital F, but we are not really, we don't really have information about capital F. We have information about lowercase f. So is, is there a way 
to go from capital F to lowercase f? The answer is yes. We start here. What's capital F at zero? We put zero for h, zero for h. This is integral from c to c, and regardless of whatever comes after this, this must be zero. So it disappears. Wonderful. Okay, how about the derivative? That's a good question. Now, derivative of this expression should remind us of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there was a formula for derivative of this expression, just with slightly different notation. But it's not so difficult to figure out that if you want to find derivative of this capital F at some number, it's just F at C plus T. So when I apply it, I put zero here, zero here, I see that the first derivative here is just f at c. And then this formula can be repeatedly differentiated, and we find that this second derivative is just the first derivative of f at c, and this is the second derivative of f at c, and so on. So we get something that looks like a Taylor polynomial, over here, over here, over here, just the derivative, the number of derivatives is smaller by one. So now we are ready to actually evaluate the errors. And for that we will need some room. Okay, let's go for it. Okay, so here is what we just did. We focused on one panel and we want to approximate the integral over this panel, which we rewrote using Taylor expansion. Now, we are going to approximate this area using a specific rectangle. What will be the error? The absolute error by definition, and let me just put uh, local here to emphasize it, is the actual value minus the area of the rectangle that we use. Let's say that we use the left rectangle. If I'm using left rectangle, then the area is the base, which is h, times the value at the left end point, which is c. And now I substitute from this formula for the integral, and I can see that fch cancels, and the error is given by this tail. One half f derivative c h square plus one over three factorial f second derivative c h cubed plus o h four. I'm going to simplify in a while, but let's leave it like that and pass to global error, because that's what's important. So the global error depends on the step size, and it's the actual integral that we are trying to figure out, minus the method that we use, which is the method of left rectangles. And for that, we have this nice compact summation formula. So it's summation from 0 to n minus 1, fxk. Okay, now a little trick. I'm going to split this integral into many integrals over individual segments in our partition. We have a formula for that, no problem. So the integral is actually a summation, k passing from 0 to n minus 1, of integral from xk to xk plus 1, fx dx, and I'm subtracting, okay, summation h times fxk, k passing from 0 to n minus 1. Okay, now, that's a difference of two sums, we can reorganize it, no problem there, we have a standard tool for it. So it's just one sum, k going from 0 to n minus 1, and let me change the integral a little bit. It's xk to xk plus h, and so on, minus h fxk. And we look at it and we say, oh, wait a second, wait a second. This is exactly the local error over one panel. So this is a confirmation, mathematical confirmation, that the global error is just a sum of local errors. And we can substitute from our previous calculation. And let's see, what do we have here? The local error is one half derivative, but now the derivative must be related to the panel that we work on. And it means that we have to take derivative at xk. Here we go. Then there will be h squared. That's this term. 
And once we have it there, we don't really care about the others. So let's lump it into one big O with H cube being the dominant power. And that's a formula. Now, this can be actually pulled a little bit farther and one can obtain an answer, but there has to be some tricks used. So instead I'm going to ask, how large is this? Good question. And for that we are applying absolute value here and we can use triangle inequality. By the way, now that I look at it, I think it might be easier for the reader if we group it like that very prominently. So I'm going to apply absolute value to these parts. And after I do that, I get the following. I get inequality, triangle inequality, summation, okay, going from 0 to n minus 1. And then there will be 1 half, of course. There will be absolute value of the derivative at xk times h squared plus o h cubed. Applying absolute value does not change the dominant rate. And now, I'm taking o h cubed and I'm actually taking it how many times? n times. So this looks good. I would like to use the same trick over here, but I cannot because those derivatives are different for each of the terms that I'm summing up. Another inequality. I'm summing up n times 1 half times the largest possible value that I can see here. Let's call it m1 times h squared plus o h cubed. Okay. So mathematically, m1, let me put it here, is the maximum of the first derivative in absolute value over all possible candidates. Well, I'm working on the interval a, b. So that's the natural place to look at. Is it a? Uh, not quite. OK. I have to reorient myself. This is a. OK. Let me continue somewhere. Uh, let's say here. Why not? So. I'm summing up expressions like that, and now they are all identical, so they are taken n times. So this will be n times 1 half m1 h squared plus n times o h cubed. What is n? Good question. n is related to the step size by this formula. If I rearrange it, n goes here, h goes down here. They can be just sort of interchanged using algebra. So n gets replaced with b minus a over h 1 half m1 h squared plus b minus a over h o h cubed, which is, now it gets interesting. Okay, I see 1 half. I see b minus a. I see m1, I see h squared divided by h, and that's it. And here b minus a is a constant, it multiplies some tail of expansion or some polynomial. It's still a polynomial where the dominant power stays the same. But then I divide by h and all the powers drop down by 1 in this polynomial or infinite series, power series. So the dominant power, uh, the dominant power will be h squared. That's it. And this is the important part. <sighs> so, that's the estimation for the global error. Here we go. Global error can be estimated from above by mainly this expression. Now you look at it and you see it exactly fits our expectations that we did a uh, short while ago. We can see the length of the integration range, we can see the steepness of the function, we can see the step size h which is used directly. So there is a direct proportion between the error and the step size. Very interesting. Let's confirm it. This is an important moment. So what do we see here? We have a function f and we introduced m1 as the measure of steepness, maximum of the first derivative. So the notation fits, I hope. Yeah, it's the same. And then here is confirmation. Uh, what we see here in the bracket is the absolute error. It's the difference between the actual integral and approximation using the rule of rectangles, left or right. Uh, 
It needs a little bit more work to do the right rectangles analysis, but it ends up with similar, idea, uh, similar formulas. Actually, you can see that they are the same. There are some little details that are slightly different. OK, the first formula is theoretical. It is based on the partition size, and I talked about it. This is necessary. But then we pass for chosen step sizes, permissible step sizes, to a, let's say, intuitively more friendly formula, which exactly matches ours. So that's confirmation of our work. Wonderful. There are some really interesting things hiding here now. Let's have a look at them. The first interesting observation is this. Our approximation of integral is composed of local approximations over each panel. So there are some steps that we did. We could think of them independently or not, doesn't really matter. Then we put it all together. When we analyzed one component, we got local error. And this local error is of order h squared. Then when we did the overall calculation, the overall approximation, and asked about the global error, it turned out it's a summation of local errors. And when you work it out, you lose one power of h. And that's very important. So the global error is just oh. And that's actually fairly typical in numerical analysis. We will see it uh, a few more times in this course. So that's one interesting observation. Another interesting observation is that the global error disappears with power 1, with h. Or you could say it's leaner. This is very important, and we talked about it when we talked about derivatives. We would actually prefer to see higher power here, and this was really nice, this, this h square, but we lost it. That's why this loss of one power is sort of sad, because we don't want to lose powers of h. This is the measure of quality of the method. Uh, let me introduce it officially. Here we go. We have a method, not just rectangles, any method for approximating integral. And we find the absolute error, we can see it over here, i minus i n, and we are trying to find an estimate in the form O H P. Now, theoretically, again, we have to work with partition size. And we already saw that partition size and uh, step size, they are related. One is one over or reciprocal of the other, more or less, up to this constant. So they are reciprocal. So down here, when we see h to p, we can expect to see one over n to p. These are really related. So when you have an estimate like that for absolute error, you say that you have order p for your method. And the higher the order, the better the method. Here. The method of left or right rectangles is of order 1, which is quite good, but not really good. Okay? It's better than nothing, let me put it that way. So this definition is an inspiration for trying something better. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit more about the order so that we can see why it is important. First of all, notice that when we talk about the order of a method, we talk about absolute error. but like just ago or something like that, we talked about errors and we said, okay, absolute error is actually not very useful as a measure of reliability. We much prefer relative error. But when you look at books, everybody talks about methods of order p and they talk about absolute errors. Why is it so? Well, here's a trick and you should know it and people who work in the area know it, but it's a little bit unfair that they are not warning readers about this. Uh, what is the relative error? Well, it also depends on the step size. According to the definition, it's the absolute error divided by the actual answer, the precise answer. Now you look at it and you say, okay, the precise answer does not depend on h at all, it's just a constant. So when you divide, you still get capital OH. And that's the whole secret. People don't bother talking about relative errors when judging methods. Because they know that if they develop some information about the absolute error, it just carries over to the relative error. Okay? So that's why people don't talk about it. I will not talk about relative errors either, but now we know that I'm entitled to it, or that there is a reason behind it. Okay, so that's the important bit. Let's have a look at this formula again. If you don't take it too seriously, if you stop being a mathematician and start being an engineer, you can say that the error is essentially 
directly proportional to step size h. This is not precisely true, but it works like that for small sizes of step h. Uh, let's make a little side trip over here. I have a code here which is actually finding errors of approximation for the left rectangle method for our integral, but for different step sizes. And I'm going to put all this information into a graph. Okay, so what we see here is the dependence of the error on the step size, and especially on the left when the step size is really small. Uh, that's the interesting part, and it does look like a straight line. So that's very nice, because it fits with what we just derived. Uh, in case you are curious about the uh, right part, where a step size is larger, it looks funny. Uh, this is caused by the fact that when the step size gets larger, there are actually fewer and fewer permissible step sizes. Uh, this is actually easy to see. Imagine that the interval that you are integrating over has length 1. Then the largest step size is actually 1, and the next smaller step size is 1 half, and there is nothing in between. So large step sizes they are actually quite sparse, they are rare, and as you go to smaller step sizes there are more and more of them available. So I had to somehow mm, take this into account when I was writing down this code, and I chose a way which is not the best one, I know that there is a better one, but what I like about this graph, about this funny part on the right, is that it actually gives us a warning that there are some things happening, and they give us an excuse to talk about it. Okay, so we just did. Uh, the most important part here is that we confirm, well, on one example, that the error for the rectangle method is actually leaner. And if you use this, you can see direct proportion, which is something that we know from elementary school. This can be used to derive, let's say, relationships. Here is an important relationship. You have a step size, and you change it. Let's say that you divide your step by some number to get a smaller step. You want to improve your approximation. What happens with the error? That's a good question. Well, because the error depends on the step size in a direct proportion, when you divide the step by some constant a, it can be factored, and you find that the new error is 1 over a of the original one. And that's important. That's the real meaning of the order of a method. We will return to this a little bit later, okay? But this picture is important. Let me show you how it can be used or what information you can gain from that. Let's return to Maple, to our favorite example. We are trying to approximate the integral from sine of x between 0 and pi over 2. The method is left rectangles. 4 is the partition size. So. Uh, let me see. I'm going to add something more. I will put output is total error. So, so that we don't have to think about it. What did I type? Okay. I haven't been looking at my, at my keyboard. So the total error is approximately 0.21. Let me make a little chart here. One, two, like that. So when n partition size is 4 and h is approximately 0.4. For the method of left rectangles, the error is approximately 0.21. What happens if I increase the partition size twice? So what happens if the partition size is 8? This means that the step size is now half, because I talked about it earlier, this is a reciprocal situation. If you increase the partition size twice, then you are actually uh, dividing by two the uh, step size. So the new step size is, let's say new, h new, is one half of the original one. That's the important thing, the ratio. Well, according to the direct proportion picture, if I decrease the step size twice, then the error should also decrease twice. So I expect to see error here, 0.1105. Now, I've been rounding up, so let's say that I expect the error 0.10. Something like that. That's my expectation. And let's see what really happens. So number of steps is 8. Bang. 0.10. Here we go. 
I can actually write it fully here, 0.10. So knowing the order of your method allows you to predict how the approximation, or rather the precision of approximation improves if you make a change in your setup. And we will get to this later. This is very useful, very important. Okay? For lean methods, this is not all that great, but we will get to better methods soon. So this is the error of the method. We just investigated it. We got lots of interesting information over here. Let me just, for the sake of completeness, attach one more picture. Uh, when I was at elementary school, we learned direct proportion, but we also learned indirect proportion. If I take partition size n, and I have some corresponding error, and if I increase the partition size a times, so we can expect a to be an integer, so that it makes sense, then the error decreases a times. Okay? So that's a picture for indirect proportion. And here is a picture for direct proportion. These are two very practical viewpoints. OK, what did we also do with numerical methods? We did method of uh, error of method analysis. Uh, we have a method. We did some experiments. Uh, numerical stability, that's an important question. Numerical stability, is there any problem here? Well, when we factor out this step h, there will be just one multiplication. We can see it over, over here. Multiplication doubles relative error. It's just one multiplication, no big deal. Then there is a summation. Summation does not increase relative error. That's a safe operation. Actually, it's just a formal summation. Could it happen that I'm actually subtracting numbers? Subtracting similar numbers? That's a good question. Well, for that, I would have to be adding a positive and a negative value of a function. Could it happen? Sure. If a function goes from positive to negative and I'm summing up, then I'm in fact subtracting. Now the trick is that subtraction is dangerous at this stage only if those two numbers are very, very similar. Now if function goes from positive to negative and they are similar, they should be almost zero. So I'm subtracting, adding almost zero. Yeah, this shouldn't be really a problem because most likely there are also some huge numbers which will create the result. So I'm not worried about that much. Uh, another possible complication is when you are summing up two numbers which are really, really different in scale. Huge number and small number. Can it happen? Well, actually, yeah, it could happen. But when you are going from left to right, this huge difference would have to mean that the function changes really a lot on a small step. And this does not happen very much with nice functions, with uh, real-life functions. So my conclusion is that the formula itself, the method itself, is actually numerically stable. It's well-behaved. I don't have to worry about numerical mistakes too much. The only complication could actually come from the function itself. And if the function is wild, then I should worry, but I should worry anyway if the function is wild. So that's another topic, okay? We'll get to it a little bit at the end. But Let's conclude this whole introductory part of the numerical integration chapter. We developed two methods, rectangle methods. They are not all that great, but they are nice. We analyzed the error of the method, and we learned a lot, especially this trick. This was very useful, so that, that, will, that will come handy soon. And we learned that the numerical stability is not really a problem. So this essentially is an overview of what we will be doing in this numerical integration field. We will try it a few more times to develop better methods, but we will generally follow this outline. Okay? So let's start thinking about a better method.